since that they have, ooh, and I'm also supposed to remind you all that we're recording this session. So there you go. We are recording the session. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, then put them in the chat. Uh, we would love it also if folks stay muted uh, until the breakout sessions, just so that we can avoid any background noise or echo. Um, and also uh, if you um, like, and we would prefer apparently that you keep your video off during the panel discussion. And I'm looking at the time here, we're at 5.04. Should we go ahead and officially get started? What do you think, Diana? Yes, do we have a Paul in the building? Paul White Paul. there. Scrolling through Scrolling the participants. I don't see him yet. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started um, and he can no. join in progress. Um, but yeah, if everyone who's not talking could mute themselves so we can limit the echo. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, wait, back. Uh, maybe back one more. Get that. Uh, okay, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Shiloh Ballard. I run the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Welcome to another one of our monthly Biketivist forums. Uh, here we have some Zoom basics, which I just went over. Uh, love for you to name yourself so that we know who you are in, in the little Zoom box. I want you to also, if you feel comfortable, uh, putting your pronouns there, and then also the city that you hail from. Uh, as we're going through today's presentation, we'd love it if you would ask your questions in the chat. Uh, again, please stay muted until the breakout sessions and keep your video off during the panel discussion. Next slide. And then uh, just some general guidelines here that we want folks to just be aware of how much space you're taking up. You all have heard this, make space, take space. Um, just be cognizant of that uh, and try to make sure that folks who aren't speaking up, especially in your breakout rooms, have an opportunity to speak and feel comfortable. Um, be respectful of one another and our differences. Don't interrupt, um, stay on topic. And of course, always assume good intent. Uh, next slide. So uh, here's the rough agenda for today. Um, love it if folks could put in the chat who they are and what micro mobility device you are most curious about. So let's get started. It is, is it for me? It's those one wheel thingies like hoverboard thingies. I have no idea how people ride those things. Um, so we're going to start with introductions, five to 505. Uh, then I'm gonna hand things off to Emma Schles, who uh, has recently left SVBC to work for commute.org. We're sad about that, but super happy that she's going to give us an overview of the history of bike share. Um, and then we're gonna do a micro, micro mobility panel Q&A with some really, really awesome folks who are uh, on the Zoom with us today. Um, for those of you who are here, you probably are curious, just like we all are. Uh, you know, you've noticed as we're riding in the bike lanes that there are more things that are not bikes that are in the bike lanes. And um, sometimes there's scooters on the sidewalk, sometimes there's um, electric bikes in the bike lanes and they're going really fast. And we're all trying to make sense of this and figure out how we advance our common agenda together. So with that, I think next slide. And um, actually, uh, while we have everyone, I just wanna put in a really quick plug that uh, the city of San Jose is having its next open streets event, which is called Viva Calle. And uh, we at SVBC, part of our role in making Viva Calle a success is we help recruit volunteers to staff intersections. Uh, so I just wanted to put a plug in here. We need folks to um, volunteer 
for the next Viva Calle. And I think someone is going, Chelsea's gonna put in the chat the link to sign up to be a volunteer. It's November 7th, it's super fun. And for those of you who live outside of San Jose, this has become a destination open streets event and open streets are the gateway drug to um, getting folks to appreciate living life outside of a car. And so for those of you who don't live in San Jose and want your cities to be doing these kinds of events, this is a good opportunity for you to come and experience it, see it and advocate for it in your city. So sign up to volunteer. Um, all right, that's all I have on that. And I am going to go ahead and kick things over to Emma. All right, thanks Shiloh. Um, and thank you everyone, I'm excited to be here. And um, you can, Clarissa, go to the next slide. I'm gonna go really fast because I don't have a lot of time, but um, just a high level summary of like bike share in the Bay Area. I'm gonna do a map form and a timeline form. Um, so here you can see three different years, 2017 through 2019. Um, originally in 2017, there wasn't that much. You can see it was on the peninsula, a little bit in the East Bay. And then in 2018, it expanded rapidly with a bunch of new systems coming in. And then some of those kind of either went away or um, you know, coalesced together in 2019. And I don't have a current map, but it would look probably even different from that now. So go to the next slide. This is the timeline version. Um, and we'll share these slides, I think, after, but uh, the 2013, that's when Bay Area Bike Share first debuted, and that was a pilot that was funded by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and it was in the cities that are listed here, so only five cities. So it was publicly funded, and it had mixed success. Um, and then in 2015, that's when a company called Motivate came in and decided to rebrand. They, they were paying for everything, so it was no longer publicly funded. And then they decided to take some of that, some of those bikes away from Redwood City, Palo Alto and Mountain View and expand into the East Bay. Um, more recently after that, there was some other dockless bike shares that were being uh, funded publicly and by cities or also some companies, private companies that wanted them on site. And then in 2017 was when the big explosion of all the dockless bikes like you may remember OFO or Blue Go Go, also Lime, which is still around Spin. There was a bunch of them all over. There were yellow, blue, green, and um, they were in every city. And those were completely funded by the companies that were putting them in there. And they weren't, they were no longer funded by the cities. And that's also when e scooters started coming in. And then since then, there's been just a lot of transition, including. You know, the original Bay Area Bike Share is now owned by, I mean, it's no longer Bay Area Bike Share, but Lyft owns that, Uber bought Jump and then turned it over to Lime. So there's just been a lot of consolidation and changes, but also a lot of those big dockless bike share companies went away. And so I'm excited to hear more from the presenters tonight. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is just showing, this is only up to 2018, but showing like how much more trips were on micromobility. And that's when particularly scooters came onto the scene, but also a dockless bike share. So there was like the more traditional station-based bike share. Um, and then when dockless bike shares and scooters came on, that's when it really went up. Um, I'm not sure what it looks like now, but next slide. So um, I'm gonna skip over this, but I'm gonna share a link to a letter that SUBC wrote with Transform, Bike East Bay and SF Bike Coalition a couple of years ago that we had some recommendations for where the region should be going in terms of bike and scooter share. And we wanted to expand um, funds for equity purposes for bike and scooter share, continue expansion, communities of concern, continue the low income discounts, um, if you go to the next slide. Also um, had some recommendations for cities permit programs. So not every city had to reinvent the wheel. And the next slide, um, some rep recommendations for how cities could create safe spaces for micromobility. So I'll share the link to that so you can review that in more detail. And I will turn it back over now to Jennifer who will be the moderator for our panel. 
Awesome. Thanks for uh, going over all that. That was really informative. Um, so we have a great lineup of panelists tonight, and we're already seeing some really good questions in the chat. So please feel free to keep um, throwing those questions in there. And um, you know, I think a lot of these things we'll hopefully touch on as we get through the discussion. But let's start by um, introducing the panelists. And I guess I'll go first. Uh, I think there's a slide with everyone's name on it. Yep. So I'm Jennifer Fearman. I am your moderator. Um, I'm a transportation planner. I've been planning for 15 years. Um, uh, originally from Florida, moved to the Bay Area in 2018. And um, I currently work at a tech company that does uh, big data for transit. And how about Vivit next? Hi, everyone. My name is Bavette Brackett. I currently am the Senior Manager for Government Relations with LINE, and I come from the community space, and I'm excited and honored to be here with everyone today. And Neil? Uh, good evening, folks. My name is Neil Patel, uh, Community Affairs with uh, Bay Wheels. And uh, I've been with Bay Wheels for about two years. Um, thanks to Silicon Valley Bike Coalition for putting this event on. Um, Y'all have been um, super resilient in kind of adapting to COVID, and I really appreciate these uh, these online forums and the opportunity to connect with folks. Uh, I've been working uh, in the Bay Area for about 15 years now, San Francisco Bike Coalition, City of San Francisco, and now uh, for Bike Share. So uh, I've been working on the issues from all different sides, and uh, happy to be here. Thanks. And Bob. Hey everybody, my name is Bob Walsh, and I am with Bird. I do uh, I work with uh, local governments and with uh, do some community outreach. Uh, been involved in shared micro transportation. I believe October, if I'm counting right, is my fifth year in uh, working with this. First with a company called Scoot in San Francisco, and then Bird bought Scoot, and I am with Bird. And I have been in San Francisco for more than sixty years. Wow, thanks. Whatever you say that, I always wonder if you said six zero, right? Six zero. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and did did Paul make it? Oh, yeah, there you are. Paul, please introduce yourself. I, can anyone hear Paul? Is it just me? Sorry about that. Yeah, Paul, Paul White with Super Pedestrian. We run the link scooter fleet. And uh, thanks for putting this on today. Awesome. So um, not super structured here. So I have a, a short list of questions and uh, folks can feel free to jump in. I mean, folks by, by folks, I mean our panelists. Um, so the first question, this is an easy one to get us warmed up. For your company, what does micro mobility mean? And I think I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna call on Bob first because you mentioned something about um, serving people with disabilities. So um, just kind of curious, what does micromobility mean for BIRD? I am muted, I caught myself. Um, Good job. What, so what does micromobility mean for BIRD? Um, you know, really to be, well, first of all, the thing I was thinking about micromobility is actually, um, I was going to say that uh, it's kind of like those little cars in the circus where you have a tiny little car and about 16 people can fit in there. And I was actually going to say that next year, Bird will be introducing our little jitney service where we will be hauling around, you know, 20 or 30 people in a teeny tiny car and spitting them out. But actually, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, that is not what we think of as micromobility. But really what micromobility is, I think the way that we define it, is a, is a small vehicle, you know, for an individual, maybe for two, that is, um, that's electric, right, that's, that's clean powered, and that is available for uh, folks to use on a, you know, on a rental basis, and typically on a one-way rental basis, right, so they can find one on the street, grab it, take it to where they want to go, and then leave it where they go, and then somebody else can use it after that. Great. Um, how about Neil? What does micromobility mean to, um, to Lyft and Bay Wheels? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to focus a little bit on the word just mobility, because um, Lyft, we are a lot more than the micro. Uh, you know, our mission is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation, and we do that in lots of ways. Um, you know, I work for the Bay Wheels team and we have a whole transit bikes and scooters division within the company. Um, 
and, and we're, we're, we're doing lots of things. You know, we're trying to get our apps to be integrated so that um, you can get a ride share, you can also get a bike or you can get a bus pass. Um, I focus on the bike share components. And uh, for us, that means providing excellent and ubiquitous and affordable bike share service um, to five communities in the Bay Area for now, um, San Jose, Emeryville, Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco. Um, you know, we are one Bay Area. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's rewarding that we have this service that, that spans kind of the whole Bay Area. And really, um, we put a big focus on connections for transit and connections into neighborhoods and destinations. Um, you know, the world, I think, kind of at the top of this presentation, um, you know, I think that the picture that was painted was just a lot of change and evolution of how all of this stuff works. And, you know, I don't think we've seen anything yet. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff on the horizon with technology, with devices, um, with expansion, um, hopefully with some more public subsidies to help support this. And um, I'm, I'm excited to, to be here with you all as we move forward. Thanks. All right, Bivet, for Lime, what does micromobility mean? And you're muted. Um, we have a saying um, at Lime that it's any place, anytime, anywhere, but pretty much um, we think of micromobility as a simple, accessible, and essential mode of transportation that's basically green, mean, and lean and that it's accessible to everyone. So we really are focusing um, a lot of what we can do on making sure that um, Lime has an equitable lens. And so we have a fleet of adaptable vehicles that we also provide to our disability community as well um, to also introduce them to different forms of EV vehicles as well. So um, I think for Lime, it's really about expanding the um, original idea of who micromobility um, really was for and who can access it and who would be able to be able to use it. And so what we saw in the, during the pandemic is that, you know, as more people were needing to get out and get to different places, that this became one of the number one modes of transportation around the globe. And so we want to continue to be a global leader in this space and make sure that everyone has access to it. That's great. Um... Paul, I swear I'm not going to call on you last anymore today. So for you, uh, I deserve. Link. I was. I deserve <laughs> trying to get. You know, I had tech issues because I'm an old man. <laughs> we we got you. What what does micromobility mean for your company? I'll just say three things. Um, replacing car trips. So, you know, micromobility isn't really working if it's not replacing passenger personal car trips and and ride hail trips, which we know are more polluting than they need to be in cities. I think um, integrating with transit is a big one, right? Are we really going to be a first and last mile solution? That means operating a service, you know, viably and hopefully profitably in the hinterlands, you know, outskirts of a city where we only might get, you know, less than one trip per day per vehicle. Um, and I think the third thing is like, how are we, playing with others, you know, how is our service impacting the walking experience, uh, people with disabilities? You know, I think micromobility to some people is a bad word. I think in part that's because the sector hasn't often, or not, you know, sometimes not lived up to its promises with regard to that third one. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, so, Moving into our next question, and I'm gonna to try to tie this into some things I see in the chat. So um, we wanna talk about what are some of the unique challenges your companies have faced uh, during the pandemic and ways that you found to be resilient. And in particular, if you have instances that apply specifically to the Bay Area that may differ than what you're doing in other parts of the, the country, we'd love to hear about that. And I'm whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll jump in. <laughs> ladies first, ladies first, you know. <laughs> so um, I will say recently it's had an um, extravagant or monumental impact on our business in the sense that um, I'm in San Francisco and in our San Francisco um, operations headquarters, um, we did have a couple COVID scares, not necessarily any one of our employees um, getting COVID at the job site or 
passing it to other people, but because um, we're regulated and San Francisco is really strict about COVID procedures, that meant, you know, shutting down, um, sending all of our employees home for 14 days, 10 days to quarantine, and then that how that reflects in terms of the service that we're able to provide um, to the community. Um, it means reduced services in areas where people are now getting used to using micro mobility a little bit more, as well as, you know, in terms of meeting all of our compliance issues and stuff like that. So I think um, as we continue to deal with um, different diseases across the world and continue to deal with COVID, I think that um, that's also going to be a challenge in terms of staffing and stuff like that, because all of our employees are full-time employees. And tacking on just uh, with another question here, what do you see as post for post-COVID? Is, is there going to be a substantial change in the way that you think about the service you provide yeah and i mean I, post covid is a very loose term right we're two years in and it's it's never ending i think it's more or less like we're just staying vigilant you know and making sure that we're using you know the best products the breast cleaning products making sure that we're staying strict to um, our requirements for our employees so we still require masks inside for our employees we still require there's a lot of requirements that we're um, putting on the table front and you know as our city mayor has required for people to be back vaccinated we haven't yet made that requirement of our employees but we're aware that you know any measure that we can to do to protect our frontline workers and is important to us and also making sure that we're protecting the community in a safe way as well bob did you want to jump in well i was just going to jump in and say that uh, the you know the interesting thing about about the the pandemic and you know the old saying about what doesn't kill you makes you stronger there is there is some truth there but what's really interesting about the pandemic is I think that pre-pandemic cities especially were trying hard to figure out where does micro mobility really fit into uh, the transportation system because you know there were impressions that this is a this is more of an amenity this is something for the tech bros and you know that kind of stuff we heard a lot of that after the pandemic hit um, most cities deemed us an essential service. They actually saw us as something that was really needed. And, and if you think about it, I mean, uh, bus services were shut down for a while. It was very difficult for people to get around. And so um, I think the business grew up over the last year. And I think we've become part of, and I think what we always should have been, um, the pandemic really illustrated that if we're talking about mode shift, if we're talking about getting people out of cars, then we really need a broad spectrum of ways to get around. And, and that includes, you know, riding your bike. It includes perhaps renting a scooter or renting uh, a bicycle or taking an Uber when it's needed. It also really includes being able to walk out your door and walk down to the corner. And I think sometimes I, Paul mentioned this, so I'm just going to reiterate. Walking is a really important part of multimodal and micro modality and everything else. And shared vehicles can really be a big part of that. Um, but anyway, I do think overall that what the pandemic did is it matured the market. It helped us define what our role is. And, uh, and I think that we're just going deeper and deeper there from, from that. It's just like being an essential transportation service and a, one of many great choices that people have besides jumping in their car and, and using their car for that, you know, short, medium trip. Neil, yeah. anything to add? Yeah, I want to tack on. I think the, the you know, bikes and scooters as essential. Um, I definitely absolutely agree with that. You know, we, uh, we made the decision to not shut down at all during the pandemic and just to stay operating from, from the get-go. Um, you know, it was a challenge financially just because there are not a whole lot of people moving, but um, we, we had a program for uh, healthcare workers to have free memberships um, during those first couple several months and you know we did some analysis afterwards across all the cities we operated and found you know an increase in trips uh, to and from stations that were near some major medical centers um, which which gave us some indication that people were actually um, you know doctors and nurses and, and pharmacists were, were using our services you know post covid um, or you know just whatever return or just wherever we're going um, you know it's gonna be interesting uh, we I, I a lot of my work focuses on our expansion efforts. Um, you know, so we are not even yet done um, with expanding the number of stations we have in the region. Um, 
we're only expanding in San Francisco right now. Every other city is kind of built out more or less with, with adjustments and tweaks as needed. Um, but in San Francisco, you know, in, in a lot of the cities, we built our network around downtowns, um, around transit. And, you know, we're, we're, we believe that, you know, downtown is not dead, that people are still going to go there to work and to play and to eat. Um, and so we're not making any major changes to how we plan our bike share network, but uh, we are vigilant. We're watchful. We're going to take a look at the data and see how things go because, uh, you know, we might need to adjust where stations are to meet people's needs. Um, fortunately, you know, while it is expen somewhat expensive to move a station, you know, they're not bolted into the ground. Um, they are, they're relatively easy to move. And so we can be pretty nimble in that way. I think in a way that, you know, a freeway uh, or even, a, you know, a subway line can't be. Um, so I think that, and, and when you look at dockless, you know, that's extremely nimble. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, bikes and scooters, we, we're definitely part of the solution and recover here. And um, I, I hope that we can ad adapt faster than other modes um, as we all move forward. Great. Um, does anyone else have anything to add about kind of the pandemic effects on, on the way we've been operating? If not, we'll um, kind of jump into some more, some more topics. Um, the question is, is about how your company deals with, um, this has a lot of things in it. So pick your poison, uh, the destruction of property, misplacement, theft, et cetera. And so I think the focus of this is kind of around where these devices operate, where they are parked, like all of those things. And I, I've seen a few questions in the chat kind of surrounding those topics. So, um, I don't know who wants to go first. Neil, Bay Wheels, Bikes. Uh, why don't you defer start? To Paul. Paul's really excited <laughs> to say something right now. Go for it. Oh. <laughs> no, Neil, go ahead. I just missed. I just missed the last round, so I wanted to make sure I uh, reminded people I'm still here. But <laughs> uh, I'll um, be brief. Um, th theft, theft is theft and vandalism is a huge problem for us. I'm not just sure for for everyone here. Um, vandalism of our stations. We actually have a just constant theft of the battery um, that's housed in our kiosk. Don't give anyone ideas here, um, but people pry open that kiosk, they steal the battery, which is more or less like a car battery. Um, and you'll see this, you know, station by station by station, uh, you know, and sometimes we can't keep up with, with um, the replacements and the repairs and it damages the user experience. And people, you know, if several stations in the neighborhood have been attacked, um, you know, that day or, or two, people can't use the system. Um, we want to partner with police departments, with, with cities to think about how we can uh, prevent and or, you know, enforce this. Um, we're improving our technology for security. Um, and then when you add in the e-bikes, uh, yeah, you know, they're everywhere. And so people are kind of stealing them with the batteries. Um, we're trying to attack that with, with at all different angles, but um, it's, it's a big problem that's really important to us. And I, you know, I don't have any solutions. I'm actually not, you know, part of that core team and I, I haven't thought creatively about it, but um, it's it's really important. I think it's something that we need to solve or at least get better at. Otherwise, I think a lot of our systems are not going to be sustainable in the long term. That's interesting. And I mean, if anyone has perspective on some of the dockless options and kind of what happens with the challenges you all face with those, I think we'd be really interested to hear about that too. I mean, I think a lot of the challenges related to this, um, you know, we've seen a lot of tech solutions thrown at these problems, but you know, we found that the decision, you know, we made pretty early on to not do any gig uh, labor and hire W-2 living wage employees across the board um, has made a big difference in terms of fleet management, you know, chasing down errant scooters, um, getting the like granular level of block by block knowledge to like inform our fleet management. And ultimately um, I think that's proven, you know, just good for our bottom line in terms of like reducing our loss rate and improving some other things about our business. So, and I think we're seeing like, that's, I think that's a trend in the industry now um, of moving away from gig, which we might all agree is a good thing. And I mean, kind of shifting a little bit away from uh, just the talk of theft, what about, you know, people who say that these bikes and scooters are parked all over the place, um, they're blocking the sidewalks, what about the management of 
these devices once you know they are being used but they're everywhere there's all over the floor at, at Dearden station like what what are some tactics we're using to address that uh just super, i mean super oh sorry go ahead yeah sorry um i think in terms of um or what they would call a micro mobility or scooter clutter or bikes clutter i think those are solutions that it can be better served with kind of getting community input um what i've seen and i'm you know, fairly new to the Bay Area in terms of this is my almost mo first month anniversary with Lime, but I'm not um, dead to the space, the micro, the transit space, but in the sense that there's not a lot of infrastructure um, throughout the cities in terms of bike in infrastructure. There's not a lot of pedestrian infrastructure. There's not a lot of infrastructure to support um, what's out there right now. And we know that the demand is bigger than the infrastructure. So for instance, um, about a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at just the um, plan for Oakland and where exactly are electric vehicle charging stations versus where are the bike racks where the lock to function has to happen, where people have to lock their scooter to that um, bike rack. And we noticed that most of the bike racks were not equitably distributed across this the city as well. So that also impacts ridership in terms of where you can park. And so I think that some of these things that we're still saying are micro issues or maybe issues in some neighborhoods and other neighborhoods have solved for them is because they've actually invested in the infrastructure to make sure that they're the right number of um, devices deployed. You know, it's deployed in areas where people are going to use them. And then also really thinking about um, which communities actually don't have access and what does that look like, like for them. And I mean, kind of tagging on to the idea about um, demand and usage, we had an interesting question about, is there any data or what does user data say in terms of why some people gravitate towards a scooter versus towards a bike? Do, do, have, have any of your companies kind of looked into that to it's see such a what's behind it? And I mean, there's a there's that question. Yeah, that question in the chat, you know, I think there's a lot of answers. I like, you know, Charles Brown from Rutgers has talked about, you know, scooters being so new, not having the cultural uh, baggage that bikes sometimes have. Um, and maybe since so many people are new to scooters, there's less apprehension about looking like, you know, being a newbie. Um, and then just like the ease of it, you know, the, the Napster report's fascinating too, just looking at how bikes and scooters have differed a little bit in terms of like trip replacement, um, which may be more reflective of the cities where bikes and scooters tend to be popular. but. Um, it's an open question, you know, Chris Cherry has been doing a little bit of research on how crash typologies between bikes and scooters might differ a little bit and really be the same in most cases. Um, but still, I think an open question. Yeah, I'll just jump in. I, I did want to get back to the previous question a little bit. There's a couple points I wanted to, to bring up. And one of them is in just getting around uh, things like vandalism and, and stuff like that. I do think that uh, one thing I'd like to touch on is that if the systems are not, if people don't feel like these systems are for them, then it can generate either apathy or even some anger. And there, it is incumbent upon the operators, people like Bird and Lime and the rest of us, to make sure that we are reaching out into all communities and we're making sure that these vehicles, um, that we're providing availability of these vehicles for everybody so that they feel like, yeah, hey, that thing parked on the corner is for me, it's for me to use. And if we don't feel that way, then we don't care if it gets knocked over. And maybe even we're a little bit angry because they're in our neighborhood and we're gonna do something you know, that maybe we shouldn't do. The other thing I wanted to point out just about clutter is it's imp what's, what sometimes isn't understood is actually the scale with which uh, micro mobility is used. So I was gonna say in, in San Jose where we operate, um, Last week, we had about 4,000 rides, okay, 4,000 different individual rides. Now, there's three other scooter operators, and there's the bike operator. So I, mean, I think we're probably talking 10,000 or so rides a week. Um, even if we looked at, say, 1% or 2% of those rides ended in a, in a place where maybe the scooter was knocked over or something, you'd still see a few, a, a number of them. But what I think is important about micromobility is to look at it in, in total. And, and certainly it should always be rated, valued on its benefits versus its costs. But 10,000 rides, and if we look at 10,000 rides and maybe somewhere around 40% of those replaced car or say Uber type trips, um, you know, 
there's a real value there. There's a whole lot of activity going on. And actually the vast majority of riders are riding in a responsible manner. You know, there's a few that aren't and we continue to, to try to fix that. So I, I did just definitely want to want to point that out. And now I forgot what the, the original question was. What was because I had something. <laughs> I could probably help um, you out, Bob, real quick, because I saw some yeah. of the questions in the um, in the chat. So maybe it's probably best if I just refer right back to those. So um, there was a question around um, is it safe and where do scooters actually belong? So California mm -hmm. has a state law where you cannot ride scooters on the sidewalk. So that is not um more and more cities are moving to the lock two function which means that um scooters cannot just be parked anywhere they must be parked and locked to a bicycle rack um previously it was one scooter per bicycle rack more cities are now moving to allow two scooters to a bicycle rack or two bikes to a bicycle rack um there are other um systems that are out there um lyft enjoys um they have a multi-bike rack that they can use as well. Um, as far as um, charging stations, what Lime has done is we now have swappable batteries, so we no longer have to, um, you know, go take our take our scooters or bikes off the road and put them onto a charging station, etc. We have um, fully swappable batteries. So those are some changes that have happened within the micro mobility space. Upgrades that all of the um, all of the operators have been doing to increase and um, make sure that we have different um, ways to try and lessen, I guess some people call it scooter clutter or and stuff like that in different areas. So those are the efforts that we all are taking. Bob, did that jog your memory at all? No. <laughs> okay, it'll come to you like tomorrow Sorry, in the Bob. shower or something. I tried. <laughs> That's right, I like your right. answer a lot anyway. Yeah, and I mean, there are a lot of really great questions uh, around this topic. Um, one that I did want to see if we have time to answer is um, if any of you have worked with any cities to designate some of those types of loaning zones, as Vivette mentioned, like the, if there's a lack of infrastructure to allow for proper placement of these, have, have any of your companies worked with cities or entities to remedy that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll add a kind of piggyback to the last question, you know, Clutter on the sidewalks. Um, cars clutter the side. Cars clutter our streets. Bikes and scooters. They do. And it's definitely a problem. And we, you know, we want to be part of the solution. You know, I think that the the data that we get around where people are going and user feedback or business feedback is actually has actually been a really great tool for us to change it. Um, you know, we encourage people to request bike racks. We worked the, the city of San Francisco's um, bike share program manager is also the bike parking program manager. Um, so it's, it's all in one house and we add more bike racks where they're needed. Um, we add them in, in neighborhoods where they don't even have any. And, you know, yes, it can be a problem initially, but, um, you know, other than people going around and counting the number of bikes that are tied to racks, um, you know, we actually have a nimble so solution to, to solve it on the, on the fly. I think, that, did uh, you? oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead Paul. I think, it, you know, it comes back to, I think a supported dedicated labor force. Um, and then, you know, GPS, right? We know that GPS doesn't work in cities with tall buildings and a lot of scooter clutter is like due to abandoned scooters because they ride into a geofenced area and then all of a sudden the geofence kicks in 30 feet later and they're left with a scooter that doesn't work. Or, um, you know, the fleet management team doesn't know where the scooter is because again, GPS is screwy. So, you know, I think it's true that all of our companies are working on solutions to this problem. Ours is called pedestrian defense, which uses you know new technology to like get a better read on where that scooter is and how it's moving. But um, I think this is probably the biggest existential you know challenge facing the industry. You know, we don't even have a chance to make a profit if we don't get a permit. And cities are looking at you know too many complaints still on you know scooter clutter. And it's true that cars do a lot more damage, but scooters are new and they're really close to pedestrians. And people I think are a nerd to a lot of the um, externalities of the automobile after a hundred years. Yeah. I guess I was just gonna say that the appetite for scooters has also grown during the pandemic for a lot of the reasons that Bob, Neil and Paul already said, um, but also um, one of the other ways that scooter use has grown is um, in our essential workers in the food business in terms of delivery service, 
Um, a lot of people didn't have ways to make income during the pandemic and went towards um, being food deliverers for like people like DoorDash, et cetera, and those companies. And um, I know we actually gave free rides to um, essential workers in that food space because we recognized that those were a lot of times um, workers who were laid off and that was their only mode of being able to get income during the pandemic. And so there is kind of this balance that's going on in terms of increase in demand as well as usage. And so um, if you look at any study or even just Google micromobility since the pandemic, um, you'll see that there's been an exponential increase in rides um, and from across all of the carriers. This has been really great. Um, I want to jump into the next topic because I know we're, we're running short on time and I want to make sure we get to talk about this. So I want to switch uh, gears and talk a little bit about um, some of the equity and inclusion considerations your companies have implemented, uh, specifically around access for low-income communities and you know access for people who may not have uh, the proper payment method or smartphones, things like that. So Let's get into that a little bit. So our policy at Super Pedestrian and our Link Scooter Fleet is to do 70% out for anyone who's on any form of public assistance. And I think having that program is one thing, but getting people enrolled is another. Some great points earlier about like people, is this service for me? Um, and so, you know, we've been doing a lot of concerted outreach, um, meeting people where they are, signing them up. Um, our sign-up rates in like Seattle, for example, Hartford, Connecticut, I think are among the best in the industry, um, but we have to do better. And um, if we're not operating our service for everyone and operating it like the best public transit system available, we're not doing our job. So um, a lot more to do. Yeah, and I'll jump in with that. Um, absolutely, it does have to be for everyone. It's interesting. I think in the beginning when we started, the cities really came to us and, and wanted us to do a lot of outreach into, you know, into areas, transit deserts, and, and perhaps economically disadvantaged areas. And the first thing that we came up with, right, is a discount program. Say, so, well, we've got, you know, it's free or it's half off or whatever. And of course, we, we got very few people to sign up. And I think it does get back to the same issue I mentioned before, which is, is this for me? If we, if we throw a whole bunch of scooters out in the, in the Bayview in San Francisco or in other areas like that, um, well, do people think, oh, that's for me to use or is that for somebody else? So some of the things that we've done, one is we do have discount programs. Um, we also have programs for folks that don't have smartphones where they can activate the scooter. It's through a texting it's actually through a texting deal. And if you don't have a bank, you can actually pay for scoot credits um, through outlets that we've got that I think you go to certain drugstores and you can you know, load up uh, and get your, your credits that way. But the other thing is that is we need to work in the community. One of them is working with community groups, right? And that is, is, is going into these community groups and talking about our program um, because the, the community groups are the ones that are, in a sense, can be an ambassador for us to say, yeah, no, wait, this, you know, let's take the mystery out of this program. You can use this program. This is something that can work for you. And uh, to that end, what we've done in our discount programs is also anyone who works for a, a 501c3 organization. So anybody at um, Silicon Valley Bike, for example, can also get uh, our discounted program. And the idea there is to encourage folks who are working with people um, who uh, may need assistance to encourage them to use the, the service and to try the service and then to, to, in a sense, say, hey, this is working for me and to try to really demystify it. And I think that, you know, I think it's a longer way to go and we, need, we, have, a, we have a long way to go. We're still trying to get more, uh, get a more diverse ridership with on our scooters. Um, but I think it's, it's a really great way to, to, to get it happening and I, uh, rather than just kind of throwing scooters in a certain area or creating some kind of a discount program. Neil, I know you had a comment. Yeah, um, you know, it's very similarly, we've got the programs. Um, you know, we have placed the infrastructure in communities. Um, per our agreement with the, uh, the region, we have a threshold of the number of stations that we have to place in what are called communities of concern, um, which include low income communities. And, you know, we are we're well above that, that threshold. Um, we have done bike rides with, with the faith community. We've 
worked with nonprofits, um, and that work is going to continue. Um, that is uh, just you know central to our mission to get people to use the bike share for all program, and just you know even if they're not low income, um, to, to use our 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 services. Uh, we've also I know that um, there's a lot of folks here that are doing interesting things around people with disabilities, um, and we you know we definitely put that in our equity uh, bucket. Um, we have a program we're doing a yeah you know, I think it's like the question of how how a bike share system um, is more accessible to people with disabilities is still a question that we are all asking ourselves. Um, right now we've got a pilot program that we've been running for about two years um, in Oakland and San Francisco. It's currently just in its last couple of months in San Francisco of um, working with BORP, Bay Area Out, um, Outdoor Recreation Program. Um, they got a long track record working with people with disabilities and getting them connected with a variety of sports, including cycling. Um, I'll, I'll put the, the URL in the chat, but um, if you or anyone you know um, wants to try out one of their adaptive bikes, we've got a program in San Francisco. You know, we're evaluating and learning um, what people want, what they need. Is this a recreation system and or transportation? How, you know, some, sometimes the devices are very specific to the person with their very specific disability. Um, and so we're definitely asking ourselves the question of how we can learn from that and, you know, apply it to a, a system that is region-wide. Thanks. And I know we're almost at time. So I've seen that we're just about at 550. So I'm going to make this last question like lightning round three words. Um, what is the future of micro mobility? <laughs> oh. I, start. I, think I, I think I said it use these words at the top, but they remain true. Uh, affordable, ubiquitable, ubiquitous and equitable. Okay. Yeah, I'll just Bob, say more. Yeah, more vehicles for more people. That's four words, but we'll allow it. Okay. Vivet. Um, multimodal, accessible, and fun. I like that. And Paul. I mean, what everybody else said. Um, I'll just add. You know, compliant. You know, I think we still have a lot to prove that we can meet sort of the basic standards that cities are setting for us. So, sorry, that's a lot of words. Compliant. <laughs> compliant and what else? That's enough. That's good. Compliant. <laughs> okay. We'll just combine all, all of your words into a phrase. Um, so, I know we're at time for the, the Q&A. Uh, so, back to SVDC, if I don't know if there's any other questions that you want us to touch upon or if you want to just go ahead and transition to the next part of our meeting. Um, I think this was really fantastic. This is Shiloh. I, I would just throw one question out there since this is our Biketivist Forum. This is the gathering of um, all of the folks who are involved in our local teams uh, and at, at the top of the hour, we will be splitting up into our Zoom rooms by city so that folks can scheme about how to get a more bike friendly infrastructure put in their community. And um, I know several of you, actually all of you, um, have been really helpful in partnering with SVBC and other bike coalitions to bring more people into the advocacy space to push people to get involved in SVBC or SFBC or Bike East Bay and other bike coalitions. Um, so thank you for that. And if any of you want to just comment really quickly about you know, how you're doing that or how you're viewing that, um, and if you've seen some really great successes out of that. I know that um, a couple of times some of you have tweeted to your, um, your users via, like you've pushed out uh, a tweet via your app, you can tell how much I know about this stuff. I can't even use the language around technology. Um, and as a result, we had a bunch of people um, contact us to get involved in our San Jose local team. So if anyone has anything they want to add on how you all are involved in getting folks, um, your, your clients involved in advocacy, we'd love to hear it. Um, I, I guess I can go. Um, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, my background is more in community relations. I'm a San Francisco native, kind of a unicorn. And one of the 
great two tools that we use here at Lyme is our Lyme Action and our Lyme Hero programs. And so those programs are a way that we work with our community partners to amplify their voices using our platforms. And so we do that multiple ways. So we do that, um, we participate with some of our partners when they do their annual events and we are able to shout them out, not only to our external customers or our writers through the writers app, we also can shoot them emails as well as we sometimes do um, events internally with our um, employees as well. So um, we, California Climate Action recently did kind of a, um, a big um, event and we were one of the um, smallest but largest organizations to have a really large amount of people to take the climate action and actually sign up. And so those are some ways that we use our technology to make sure that we're evangelizing more people and um, including more people in some of the great work that our partners do. And so it's really important for us to hear from all of our community members, whether they you know, love scooters, hate scooters, love bikes, hate bikes, but it's really about starting those conversations and bringing people into the room and start having those discussions so that people can understand that you know, an electric bike, a regular bike can be for you and just providing opportunities to be at community events, et cetera, so people can get their first try. Um, safer streets, uh, better policies is a win for all of us, um, even people that don't use our services. Uh, and we, we support a lot of infrastructure projects and changes that are happening in the cities we operate. Um, and we push out messages um, or alerts to riders and you know, we're able to um, even tailor them for people that perhaps, you know, when, when the Better Market Street project was happening in San Francisco, we were able to um, find out who had used a bike share uh, along Market Street or near Market Street and kind of send them a tailored message to get them to get involved, learn more, um, and send a message out. And um, we want to do a lot more of that. So, uh, you know, Charlotte would love to work with you and others to learn learn about what's what's coming up and how we can help you know, at the very least, just to get our, our riders engaged uh, in understanding what's happening in their communities, as well as tapped into the work that you're doing and tapped into the work that others are doing um, and speak up. I'll just jump in, just say um, we have worked um, with with bike coalitions, the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition and San Francisco Bike East Bay and others. We just find those are great natural partnerships. Um, it is great to leverage our ridership on on issues that are important to everyone. We did do a. I think for Bike East Bay, we, we did a thing where we sent a push notification, which means that everybody that opened up their app in San Jose over about three weeks saw uh, a notice about uh, about uh, the, the great bike ride that happened uh, at the last Viva Calle and, um, and then a button to click to go and to sign up for it. And that's something we'd like to do more of. But we've also done uh, a couple of years ago, we campaigned for Clean Power SF. We've also campaigned for the uh, Great Walkway, the Great Highway Project in San Francisco. So we do try to leverage our our riders to to get them to to activate them to get them to work on on things that, that are important to us and important to our partners. All right. Anyone else on that? Otherwise, we will move on. Oh, I just wanted to give a quick plug for you guys that now that you guys are new Lime Hero partner. Um, for people who currently ride scooters or bikes in San Jose and are members of Lyme, they can opt in to be in our hero program. And what that means is that if someone's ride is $1.33, um, it will charge them $2. And the difference of that will go directly to the Silicon, Silicon Bike Valley Bike Coalition. So that's how our hero program works. So your scooter friends are actually giving you guys money now. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists to help inform us better about uh, micromobility and the micromobility world. And Jennifer, thank you for moderating this panel. Um, hopefully this was incredibly enlightening for everybody. Um, we have just a few minutes before we move into our breakout rooms. And um, let's see, can we go to the next slide? We have some stuff we just wanted to go over. Uh, so yes, thank you, guest panelists.
And uh, for those of you who heard about this forum and you, maybe you didn't even know what SVBC was and you just signed up, um, we need you to get involved and it's super cheap. It's just $35, which is a floor, not a ceiling. Um, someone will probably drop a link in the chat there for you to officially join, but please get involved. We need everybody uh, pushing so that we can have awesome bike friendly communities. Next slide. All right. And so uh, since we have your attention, also want to highlight some uh, things that are coming up. And of course, first and foremost, we need to wish Diego Ortiz, who's a brand new uh, member of the SVBC team, a happy birthday. It is his birthday today. Um, so happy birthday, Diego. Uh, and um, just wanted to highlight some things that are coming up. Uh, we have our usual classes. We do basics um, and then a little more advanced classes on how to ride. Uh, may not be for the people on this call uh, or this Zoom, but if you know people, please, that's what it takes. It takes personal outreach. One of you tapping a peer and saying, hey, you should sign up for this class and start writing more. So please spread the word to your uh, non-writing friends or your friends who just um, need to increase their bike confidence a bit. Um, we also have a ride coming up, Ride to Rancho San Antonio on the 6th of November. Uh, the link is there. I mentioned earlier that Viva Calle is coming up again. It's on the 7th of uh, November and Cisco on our team is frantically wrangling volunteers because we um, need to find folks to staff the intersection so that people can cross some of these streets safely. It's really fun and a great opportunity, especially for local teams to sponsor an intersection. We would love it if some of our local teams would just take an intersection, adopt it, set up a booth, bring out volunteers and um, help make sure that people have a wonderful uh, experience at Viva Kai. So the link is there. Um, also another uh, bike class there. Uh, we also have our farm box delivery program by bike. That's our partnership with Vegilution, where we deliver fresh pro produce by bike to families in East San Jose. Um, and I think that's everything. Am I missing anything? Hearing that's everything. Me? All right. Um, <laughs> let's see, let's go to the next slide, see if I missed anything. Um, Okay, our next, yes, our next forum is November 17th. And it is on the very exciting topic of repaving and restriping streets, almost ex as exciting as parking. Um, for those of you on these calls, you actually understand this stuff is quite interesting and, and exciting. Um, so mark your calendars and next slide. So now we are going to um, release you all to your city teams. Uh, these are the ones that we have set up. Um, and I'm wondering if one of our staff folks can just chime in and instruct folks on how to make sure that they can select their team. Anyone want to chime in? <laughs> 